It's one of the most frequent stories we tell on this channel. The old days on the water and Bangkok's iconic and historic canals. The root of Thai food and where so much of modern cuisine was first sold from boat to boat so many years ago. Now today's Bangkok might be a modern and industrial city, but there are still places to catch a glimpse of the old life with a weekend road trip to tour Thailand's famous floating markets. These are, how would you say this? Bullshit is the wrong word. Um, tourist trap? Uh, not entirely real? We're going on a path where few have gone before, that's not true, where everybody's gone before. Today, here on OTR, we're exploring the roots of Thailand's famous floating markets and trying to find out not just how this ancient culture influenced the local food scene, but how it's turned into an amusement park. And whether somewhere, somehow, there's still food served that'll make us feel like we've gone back in time. Now today we're spending our time in an area famous for floating markets. The ones you're most likely to visit when you come to Thailand are built along canals that date back to 1868, when they were completed after three years of construction in a project that would bring life and prosperity, agriculture and commerce to the provinces west of Bangkok. But these markets, they don't date back to 1868 at all. In fact, only one still standing has a history as far back as 1968. We've spent plenty of time on this channel explaining how the industrialization under King Rama V led to the construction of roads and structures and society moving inland. But the change from rotten houses to skyscrapers didn't happen all at once. In fact, there were still parts of Bangkok living an ancient lifestyle by the time the first Western tourists started partying in the city's go-go bars and watching fights at the Muay Thai Stadium. On the Tonburi side of the Chao Phraya River, one of the last parts of town still undeveloped around those years was near a temple called Wat Sai, where every few days the villagers would gather on their sampans and buy and sell food and produce. Now, this caught the attention of tourists and, in turn, travel agents, who organized groups for foreigners to get there by boat and take photographs of one of the most unique sites in the entire world. Now, roads in progress came to Wat Sai, and in 1965, that original market disappeared. But its surprise popularity had caught the attention of the Thai government. And just a few months after the old markets had all gone extinct, plans were made to build a new one, this time intended for tourists. They settled on a small village of wooden houses along a canal called the Damnern Saduak, and it would open in 1966. By 1972, the new market had outgrown the village and moved to open land a few hundred meters away, along with a dedicated new road straight from Bangkok. And that's the road where we're driving, on our way to start our mission at the world's most famous floating market. ประมาณสักเจ็ดขวบแปดขวบพี่หนูก็เริ่มมารับบริการเอ่อภายเรือรับฝรั่งนี่แหละพี่ขายของบ้างขายของโชว์บ้างภายเรือรับฝรั่ง
ได้เลือกเรือพี่ทั้งเรือภายและเรือเครื่องเรือภายและเรือเครื่องเรือภายและเรือเครื่องเรือภายและเรือเครื่องเรือภายและเรือเครื่องเรือภายและเรือเครื่องเรือภายและเรือเครื่องเรือภายและเรือเครื่องเรือภายและเรือเครื่องเรือภายและเรือเครื่อง But it's worth pointing out that this doesn't look like any floating market a time-traveling 19th-century Bangkokian might recognize. In fact, the name "floating market" is kind of a mistranslation. In Thai, these places are simply called Talad Nam, which means water market, and in the old days, that could just as easily mean a market built on land but accessible from a pier where customers would ride up in their boats to buy what they need. There were places like this where both buyers and sellers were on the water, but not in any kind of permanent way. It was more like every couple of weeks, each village might have a set time when farmers and traders would arrive from the countryside with their goods, and locals would paddle out to shop. And then a few hours later, the canal would just be a canal again. This kind of nine-to-five organized chaos. Well, I mean, that started right here. So here's the danger. We stop the boat for a minute to eat and to look at what's around us, and now we are getting just obliterated by vendors. I had been offered everything at this market in about the last one minute: satay, coconuts, coconut ice cream, mangoes, mango sticky rice. Uh, the crispy pork, s a u t é s right there. I'm pretty sure if we just sat in this one place, it would end up being like uh, vultures picking my dead body apart. Um, it's been a really nice boat ride, but the key on the water here is keep moving. It's like a shark. Shark stops swimming, the shark dies. Don't stop swimming. I want her to show us what she would eat when she comes here. หนูแล้วคะหนูเป็นคนชอบกินผัดไทยผัดไทยกุ้งสดอยากเห็นไหมคะ But that's foreigner food. That's what foreigners eat, right? We want to show, you know, what is. Every foreigner comes here and they think that uh, the food that's meant for tourists is authentic Thai food. But authentic Thai food is so much better than American. foreigner food. Thai food. We have a few more destinations, and I won't waste a lot of time on the food here because the food was exactly what you'd think it would be: crowd-pleasing specialties with no real connection to the history of the great canals, and made in such massive volumes that even the best stuff is put together with all the care of a fast-food hamburger. The sad reason for that disappointment is also the reason we're optimistic about our other destinations, and we'll explain that part later. But the very quick story is that after this place opened and tourists started coming, a Thai Chinese businessman from the capital, known by the name Gui, saw an opportunity and began hawking trinkets and mass-produced souvenirs. His approach proved successful, and to avoid fighting with locals selling their own goods like vegetables, Gui bought a plot of land adjacent to the new market and built his own platform and pier. He paid agencies to send tourists to his entrance, and his section expanded, and more outsiders joined in. And within a few years of the market opening, the history it was meant to honor had been completely squeezed out. Now that doesn't mean that this place hasn't been a positive for the region. The people who grew up here still make their living on the water, and even if our quest for ancient and amazing food is going to have to wait for our next stop. Well, that doesn't mean that there's not still something a little bit charming about spending a morning paddling around the amusement park equivalent of a floating market. ถามว่าชาวต่างชาติชอบไหมชาวต่างชาติชอบนั่งเรือเที่ยวพี่แล้วชาวต่างชาติเป็นคนน่ารักมากเจอทีไรก็ให้ยิ้มแล้วเขาก็เราก็ถูกใจเขาเพราะเขาเป็นมาเที่ยวเมืองไทยเราชอบเขาเขาชอบเราเรารักเขาเขาก็รักเราเรายินดีต้อนรับเขาเขาก็ยินดีต้อนรับเราเช่นกัน Good luck.
Okay, so we've spent the last 15 minutes driving in circles trying to find parking here at Ampawa Floating Market, which is one of the two biggest and most famous ones outside Bangkok. Uh, we, found, we found a place to, to park, but it was like gonna be a, a long walk through massive crowds and uh, vendors everywhere selling trinkets and knickknacks and bull And if we have one rule on OTR, it's that we are not gonna work that hard to eat mediocre food. We will work as hard as it takes to eat amazing food. So we are just driving straight through the parking lot and continuing to a different floating market that we think might be better. It's right down the road. All right, um, we did not set out to try to uh, improvise like this. We thought we had a pretty clear plan of where we're gonna film, but Daria in agreement on this? Absolutely. Anand, agreement? Yes. Yeah? All right, let's let's, let's, <laughs> let's find some slightly better food and maybe potentially much better food. We have a good, we're off to a good start. Got a lot of homegrown products. We've got honey from a farm, garlic. When the first table that you see in a floating market is garlic covered in dirt, that means that we're not in tourist land quite as much anymore. Uh, but we're here for the floating market part of this. So as much as I want to try some of this stuff, I want to get to the boats first. This is Taka Market, and this was starting to feel promising. Here, there was a laid-back village kind of atmosphere and so much food all around that I couldn't wait to start. Taka on the map is pretty much directly between Damnon Sadwak and Ampawa, but culturally it really couldn't be any more different. Here, the market is far from the main roads, tucked between farmland and coconut palm plantations. It's not easy to find, and the ramshackle surroundings make it feel like a real slice of old Thailand. It's tempting to look at something like this and just assume it's authentic, while seeing something like our first stop as nothing but a monument to capitalism. But the truth is, this one's actually even newer. And like every single floating market today, it also comes from a government initiative meant to boost tourism. But there is one critical difference that explains why this one doesn't look like its more famous cousin. And it's the key to understanding why these two places on the same canal feel so wildly different. Thanks in part to the success of tourist landmarks like the floating markets, by the end of the Vietnam War, Thailand was one of the most visited countries on Earth. Within a generation, driven by a booming tourism sector, the Thai economy was prospering. But there was a growing divide between the urban elite and the rural poor. Even countryside attractions like Dam Non Sadwak had primarily put money into the hands of rich investors like Gui, instead of benefiting the villages where they were built. So with growing poverty in farming communities, the government came up with a program known in English as CBT, or Community-Based Tourism. The idea was to work within a local culture to find ways to bring visitors through things like floating markets, but with the money generated intended to remain in the villages and to sustain traditional ways of life. At Taka, the idea was to take the local food and craft markets that long ago moved from water to land and simply put them back on the water with a few extra touches. The Tourism Authority brought in experts to help turn waterfront houses into homestay accommodation, and traditional local crafts like making sugar from coconuts were promoted as cultural heritage. That idea, by the way, was not limited to just this one market. If you remember, in our Hallmark video, we visited a floating market in the middle of Bang Ka Chow. That one was built in 2004 as part of the same CBT initiative, and it's fully controlled by the Bang Ka Chow community. Only locals are allowed to sell at the market. Products must be made or sourced locally, and nobody is allowed to sublet their space. It's been a tremendous success, one also mirrored by famous markets like Talim Chan and Konglat Mayon, both of which see thousands of tourists visit every week to catch a glimpse of an ancient lifestyle 
and both of which were also built in the early 2000s, with the money going directly to the local people. Now, Taka was one of the first markets built under this initiative, and it wasn't without complications. By the new millennium, most of the young people here had left, going off to the factories or to find work in Bangkok. The farmers and cooks who remained were from an older generation and still ran the market like in the really old days, opening only when the lunar calendar said to, no more than a few days a month. So the government paid each vendor a wage of 300 baht per day just to show up on a normal schedule. That way, when visitors would come, they'd at least find the market open. The payment stopped after a year, but by then, this market had caught on and earned a reputation. And that reputation, most of all, came from the famous local food. Okay, so what do I do with this? Open and eat? Okay. Let me show you real quick. So this is going to be the fermented uh, sticky rice, which is going to be uh, mildly alcoholic. I think this fermented even more just sitting out in the sun this morning. And now it's like, and it's proper full on like, I would guess 10 to 12%. Mm. Give it a drip. I have another spoon in here if you prefer. All right, so we had two more markets to visit, and the last place was awesome, and we were driving even further from the highway. But it had become clear that on this mission, there was one thing we'd just have to accept. All right, first, there's something I don't think I've told you before on this channel. The first time I came to Thailand, I really didn't like it. Actually, the first several times I came, I wasn't really a fan. The problem with tourist economies everywhere is that over time, two parallel countries take shape. There's the one where people live and work and struggle and survive, and the one intended to give you the experience you want, to create the place of your imagination. And eventually that fiction becomes a reality, at least when you're only here for a short time. In Bangkok, perhaps the most densely packed hotel district is in an area on Sukhumvit known as Nana. This was where in the 1960s most of the western quality hotels were located, and so it's where tourists would typically stay around the time that floating markets became trendy. With so many tourists staying in one place, hotels and entrepreneurs set up travel agencies all around to help foreigners get to the popular spots and to take their own cut of the profits. They set up shared van trips and organized itineraries to places they knew would make the most money and draw the biggest crowds. Raja Damnorn Stadium, the Grand Palace, and Damnorn Sadwak Floating Market. This was what we wanted, and an industry developed to make sure it's what we got. All around these places would come more businesses catered to foreigners. Massage parlors, go-go bars, souvenir stores. We wanted Thai food, but got disgusted by organ meat, so we got a steady diet of pad thai and mango sticky rice. By the 1990s, most locals got around by car or motorbike, but we like tuk-tuks. So inside the bubble, that's the, quote, authentic mode of transportation. It's a well-oiled machine, and Thailand does tourism better than almost anywhere, but there's still something a little bit, I don't know, Truman Show about all of it. Something just feels a little bit off. I hated it, and hated coming here, because that's all I'd seen. That's all I thought there was. Now, obviously I was wrong, and I hope this channel is my long-form apology for how wrong I was, but I still have a visceral fear or hatred of setting foot back inside that bubble. 
Sometimes I know I go too far and overshoot the moral high ground. Like, after moving here, I swore I'd never go to a fight at Raja Damnorn. It's popular and touristy and just unfathomably overpriced for foreigners. And yet, honestly, it's a ton of fun, and if you want to feel some kind of authenticity, just leave the ringside seats and walk up to the third deck and sit behind the chain-link fence with the gamblers and degenerates and you'll have the time of your life. Like, that's the thing here. Both worlds exist right on top of each other. It's possible for something to be made for tourists and yet authentic all at the same time. And even in a floating market built by the government for the purpose of generating tourism money, you might still find that the old traditions you thought were extinct are actually right there, exactly where they're supposed to be. Jasper, you want to ask anybody if they have there's a floating market? It is hot. I don't know where we are. We've messed up our shoot already and blown off the second location. Uh, now we're just following the canals where it takes us. I don't know what our mission is, but we are on a mission. All right, so in the order of things that are exciting for a food guy, there are markets entirely for tourists, markets built for their community to service tourists, and then markets so hidden that you've got to stop to ask for directions. This was it, the holy grail. This is something I honestly didn't even know existed in 2023. A floating market built as part of the CBT program, but one in a place where the old canal culture never really stopped. Where local customers come here for their everyday food. And where the vendors, well, the ones that we met, they've been doing this for so long that they made their living selling food from their sampans before the roads were built. And never gave up a way of life that maybe isn't extinct after all. สมัยโบราณน่ะเยอะมากนะเรือเนี่ยเนี่ยฝั่งลุงค่าฝั่งนู้นน่ะเยอะมากนี่เค้าเลิกกันไปไงเค้าแก่ตัวเค้าก็
of the fish cakes. Oh my God. There's so much flavor in that. All right, I'm gonna try some of the stuff that we bought from the, um, from the ladies on the boat. It's salty, tiny bit sweet. You see the chunks of coconut in here. I mean, that's all just chunks of fresh coconut. It's so good. This is like transcendent level good. And that's worth the drive level good. Yeah, man. Uh, mission accomplished. This is super cool. Um, can you find a great meal at a floating market? Yes. You just got to work a little harder to get there. ก่อนนี้มีเรือขายออกมาขายของประมาณ As you can probably tell by the sound, we are on a dirt road, which is a first in central Thailand for us. Uh, but we've gone about as far away from the tourist trail as we can and still be in this uh, Ratchaburi um, floating market area where this, you know, this big space where all the canals are still intact and there's still a floating market culture. And obviously, as we've told you throughout the day, most of that is preserved for tourism. We have found some places that are not, and man, how cool was that last place. But yeah, so far so good. I think that we have pretty appropriately proven the point that if you want good food, you don't go where all the tourists go. Um, wasn't coming out here to try to prove that point. We really wanted to be open-minded, but man, there's such a difference in how uplifting it feels sitting by the river in a place like that last place versus getting just hounded by vendors screaming at you to buy pad thai and mango sticky rice. So I was standing here just a few minutes ago and we're talking about how, you know, oh, this is a bust, it's not a floating market. And Anand made the point that actually, this is probably a more authentic version of a floating market than anything else that we've seen. Because here, even though it's listed as a floating market, it doesn't look like what we expected, but you, we're standing on a pier, every market stall, selling meats, selling vegetables, selling homemade goods. They all have a pier and they're inland buildings built out onto the river and so this is nothing touristy at all about this. It's not photogenic, but when you talk about the actual authenticity of a floating market, this might be closer to the truth than anywhere else we've stopped. Here, if you wanna buy something, you know, and, and what the vendors were telling us is that for a long time now, nobody really comes up to these piers. They're pretty much abandoned now, you know, all the commerce is done inland. But the way this used to work when it was built would be, you know, this is a market. It's, it's the same as any other wet market in Bangkok, except, Everyone has these piers where you want to come buy something, you, you, you come up on your boat, and you buy what you need, and then you continue. And um, I think if you want to really kind of get a sense of what commerce truly would have been like in, in Bangkok, you don't go to a place like, I mean, there is a reason why people like going to those photogenic uh, uh, floating markets. Daria, how did our reel do? Or how did the, the uh, Instagram story end up doing from the, the first place? Very well. So, I mean, there's a reason why everyone wants that classic photograph of the beautiful boats in the middle of the canal. Um, 
but in terms of the actual authenticity of going back in time to what Bangkok used to be like, you know, ignore the highway, ignore the sound of the cars going by, ignore the giant hospital in Bangkok Bank Tower over there. And you just imagine being here at a wet market where, you know, you come up here on your boat, you buy what you need and you continue. And, and this is really what it looked like. This is, this is our, it's kind of a cool way to end in some ways because this probably provokes a little bit more thought you know, than, than anywhere else we've been. A little disappointed that everything's closed, but you know, what are you gonna do? We had a great day. Subscribe to the channel for more from OTR. Thank you so much to everyone who supports us on Patreon. It means a lot to us and really helps. Find links to our social media in the description box below.